well, I, I will assume you, you are seeing my screen. Um, so, good morning, everyone. I'm Laia Vecchius, and I will talk about the project that I've been doing this last year at Manuel Palacin's lab of amino acid transporters and disease. And it is about the generation of complexes with nanobodies and megabodies in order to solve a new conformational structure of the Basque transporter. Um, first, I will start with an introduction of the, the themes that I will talk about, then we will go on with the objectives. Um, then I will talk a little bit about the experimental approach that we followed. Um, then we will talk about the results and the discussion of those, and we will end with the conclusions. So first of all, um, we uh, in, in our group, we study L-amino acid transporters or LADs. They are membrane proteins um, that are obligatory transporters of amino acids. And um, they have 12 strand membrane domains, which are alpha helixes. In humans, they are related to autism spectrum disease, lysinuric protein intolerance, cystinuria, age-related tearing loss, cataracts, and cancer. Um, some of the LAD structures are, have been solved, such as the structure of LAD1, BO plus AT, and also BASC, with, which was solved um, by my lab, by the, peop by the people in my lab. So um, the problem is that all these structures are in an open to conformation, as you can see here. And um, we have no representatives of um, molecules that have been solved in the other conformations. So um, in my um, group, we study BASC, which is the bacterial alanine serine cysteine transporter. And um, it, it, it is being studied um, with the use of nanobodies. Nanobodies are small parts of antibodies. And they are single domain antibodies. And they were um, produced by immunizing a llama with um, BASC reconstituted in proteoliposomes. And with the um, phase display system or technique, um, 29 nanobody sequences were selected, and those are the ones that we use um, to study our protein. Um, Basque, well, a structure of Basque was solved with, in complex with nanobody 74 with a resolution of 2.9 Armstrongs. Nanobody 74 um, binds at the cytosolic site of Basque with high affinity. Um, in order to find other conformations of this transporter, um, study of the sightedness of interaction by transport inhibition assays um, have been done, and also conformational studies by single molecule thread um, using different nanobodies. Another approach uh, to study uh, the conformations of Basque or to find new structures is the use of nanobody and cry electron microscopy. Megabodies are formed with a nanobody plus a scaffold protein in a single chain. They maintain the binding specificities of the nanobodies, but with the scaffold protein, they create bigger structures, so larger structures that are better for cryo-electron microscopy, which is a technique that needs um, big structures, and BASC alone or BASC with a nanobody isn't big enough to use this technique. Some advantages of the cryo -EM are that no crystallization is needed, which is um, often a, a difficult or a tedious process to follow and also less protein amount is, is needed. And there's a, the possibility of multiple conformation solving because the particles or the proteins are arranged in different positions in a grid. So with a single scan, we can find uh, different conformations. In our lab, we have two scaffold proteins um, bound to different nanobodies, and those led up to 55 and 100 kilodalton megabodies. So the, the final objective of my study was to solve a new conformational structure of BASC uh, with whether nanobody or megabody complexes. About the nanobodies, we wanted to, we wanted to obtain pure BASC and nanobody 71 proteins, uh, we also wanted to evaluate the binding with between labeled BASC and nanobody 71, um, also obtain purified BASC and nanobody 71 complexes, and seize the BASC nanobody 71 crystals. About the megabodies, we want to obtain BASC and megabody 71, the purified proteins, and the megabody in both the 55 and 100 kilodalton uh, form, and also uh, obtain and purify the BASC and megabody 71 complex. 
So the experimental approach that we followed was first to express uh, our, our proteins, then uh, follow a purification, and then with the purified proteins, we could, we could do some binding evaluation assays. And parallel to that, we could do complex purification with size exclusion chromatography, um, both with, with uh, complexes of BASque with the, with the nanobody and BASque with the megabody. Then uh, we, wanted, we, we did some crystallization assays with BASC and Nanobody 71. And we also want in the future to do some cryo EM experiments with BASC and the megabody. And these two techniques uh, should converge in the solving of a new conformational structure of BASC. So here we have an image of the silver staining gel of the Nanobody 71 expre expression and purification. Uh, Nanobody 71 has a heat stack at the C terminus, so it is purified using this stack, so, and um, it is eluted with imidazole. In the first lane, we can see the periplasmic fraction, which, which contains a lot of proteins, and we see a big band corresponding to the Nanobody 71. Through all the steps of the purification, this band is slightly um, smaller, and at the end, with the imidazole elution, we see that we have a big band that corresponds to the nanobody 71. So we expressed um, this protein in E. coli and we obtained it with high purity. Next, we can see the basque expression and affinity purification. So these are the coma staining and the in-gel fluorescence of the same SDS uh, page gel. Um, basque is expressed as a fusion protein to GFP and it is all, all um, all along the way treated with DDM, which is a detergent because it's a membrane protein. At the C terminus, we have a heat stack. Uh, so at the C terminus of the GFP, there's a heat stack, which is used um, to retain the, the fusion protein in our column. And um, there's a C3 protease cleaving site between BASC and GFP. So this is with the 3C protease um, is the way that BASC is eluted. So in the Comasi staining gel, we can see that um, we have a lot of proteins and at the first with a 3C elution, we can see that BASC, a band corresponding to BASC is eluted. And then we have the imidazole elution, which um, eludes the GFP and GFP is found in a dimer form. In the angel fluorescence, um, we can see a, a fluorescent ba um, band corresponding to the BASC and GFP um, fusion protein. And at the end lane corresponding to the imidazole elution, we can see a small band corresponding to the GFP elution and in the monomeric form and a big band corresponding to the GFP dimer. This is an artifact of the technique. So GFP in, appears as a dimer in, in this gel. So we obtain BASC with, with high purity and cliffs from GFP. So um, the use of single molecule FRET techniques requires labeling of, of our molecule of BASC with fluorophores. And we know, as I already told you, the nanobody 74 binds to the cytosolic site of BASC. One of these fluorophores that we use is CI5, and it also binds to the cytosolic site, but it doesn't interfere with nanobody 74 because it can take up many conformations inside the same conformational cloud. So um, we know that they don't interfere because the structure of BAS with nanobody 74 has already been solved. We now want to study nanobody 71 because it um, it gave some interesting movements in our on our protein with the single molecule FET experiments, and we know that it binds at the extra extra um, cellular side. So in principle, it should have no interference with the CI5. But to be sure, we did some microscale thermophoresis assays um, to detect the binding of labeled BASC and if um, whether the, the um, the CI5 was interfering with the binding of this nanobody or not. So microscale thermophoresis or MST is a technique that um, consists in the heating of the sample and then the movement of the particles um, that move away from this heated point of the sample is monitored. So this movement is monitored um, thanks to the, to the fluorescent label, in this case CI5, 
um, the movement of this particle depends on the shape, the size, and the charge of our particle of Basque in this case. So um, if we bind different, so different concentrations of our nanobody, we can determine if it is binding or not, um, whether to, to see if it changes um, depending from the Basque without the, the nanobody 71. So first we did this assay with Basque and nanobody 74 to determine that, the, that this technique was good for, for our protein and that it worked because we already know the, the structure and the affinity and we saw a, a binding curve. So nanobody 71, as we expected, binds to label Basque, which means that the CI5 does not interfere with the binding. Next, we did it with nanobody 71 and we obtained two binding curves and two KD values that are um, in, well, between the same nano, inside the same nanomolar range. So we concluded that nanobody 71 binds to labeled Basque and that the CI5 label doesn't interfere with the binding of our nanobody. Next, we did the complex purification um, with size exclusion chromatography, as you may already know. Um, in size exclusion chromatography, bigger molecules come out earlier and smaller molecules have a bigger retention volume, so they are looted uh, later in time. So with a sample with Bascalone, we have a peak around 12.4. Uh, uh, with a sample of nanobody 71 alone, we have a peak that with a bigger retention volume because it's a smaller molecule and it comes out later. And pre-incubating Basque with nanobody 71, we see also the small peak um, of, oh sorry, we see the peak of 16.5, um, around 16.5 um, milliliters, and there's less um, protein amount but it's the same, nano, it's the peak of nanobody alone. And there's less protein because most of the nanobody is bound to Basque. So we can see a shift peak in to the left from the Basque alone because Basque with nanobody 71 is a bigger molecule. So it comes out earlier in time. So we had purified the Basque and nanobody 71 complex. Next, we did some crystallization assays with Basque and nanobody 71, which was purified in the preview step. And this was done in collaboration with Jonah Fort and Adrian Nicolás. And we did a lot of, well, um, several screening plates with different conditions. And in well H10 of the PAC-13 plate, in these conditions, we obtained these irregular crystals. Um, we did some optimization plates, but they, there was no improvement in crystal formation. So we, we took those crystals to the, to the Alba synchrotron to diffract them, and they, we obtained a, a pattern of protein crystallization so that the crystals were made of protein and they weren't salts or anything else. Um, but it was too low resolution, so we couldn't obtain any good um, structural data of those crystals. So we obtained irregular protein crystals of our complex and we couldn't obtain uh, structural data, but um, nevertheless, it's a technique that, that is, is used with, with other nanobodies and, and so on. So because we didn't obtain very good results uh, with the crystals, we did the megabody expression and purification to um, find another approach to, to structure solving. So as I already told you, we have the megabody of 100 kilodaltons. And this gave a, a band in the, pur in the purification. It gave a single band and of around 100 kilodaltons. So it was our megabody. With a 55 kilodalton megabody in the illusion, we saw two bands, one around 55 kilodalton, which was our smaller megabody, but we also had a bigger band. And we thought this might be a dimer, but to be sure, we did another test and um, we added DDT and also boiled, boiled the sample. So this is the result. And here we can see in the third lane, um, the Bascan, the, oh, the, I'm sorry, the Megabody 71 sample without boiling it and without adding DDT. And we can see the two bands. But um, when we boil and add DTT to the sample, we see a single band. Um, this confirmed that, the, that this dimer that appeared is an artifact of, of the technique and that we have our, our nanobody, our megabody 
71 of 55 kilodaltons in, in, in a purified form. So we had the two megabodies expressed and purified, and we could do um, the complex formation with size exclusion chromatography. So with a sample of Basque alone, we obtain a peak of around 1164, incubating Basque with megabody 71 of 55 kilodaltons, we obtain two peaks, one corresponding to the megabody, which has a bigger retention volume because it's a little bit smaller than Basque. And we have a, a peak that comes out earlier because it's the complex of Basque with megabody 71 of 55 kilodaltons. With the Basque and megabody 71 of 100 kilodaltons, we have um, a, a peak uh, that comes out earlier than the previous megabody because it's 100 kilodalton, so it's a bigger molecule, so it comes out earlier in time. And we have another peak that corresponds to the Basque and megabody 71 complex, and it comes out slightly earlier than the previous megabody because it's a slightly bigger molecule. So we had purified the Basque and megabody 71 complexes, both in the 55 and 100 kilodalton forms, and um, these samples uh, will will be used in the future for for cryo-electron microscopy uh, assays. So to conclude, we expressed and purified enough protein, Basque nanobody 71, and both megabodies um, to perform the future further experiments. Um, we also confirmed that nanobody 71 binds to labeled Basque and that so that the CI5 does not interfere with the binding of our nan nanobody and this validated um, the previously done single molecule threat experiments. We also established, established that MST is a good technique to detect the uh, binding of fluorescent labeled proteins and it, it, so with this determination we, we will use this technique um, in future experiments in our lab. We also obtained um, Basque and Nanobody 71 crystals. And although they didn't give a good diffract, also a diffraction pattern with enough resolution, um, this technique has been used in our lab and will be used further because it gives good results most of the time. And uh, to finish, we purified the Basque and Megabody 71 complexes, both in the 55 and 100 kilodalton forms. And these um, samples will be soon used in the cryo electron microscopy assays. Well, thank you for your attentions. I would like to thank um, the whole amino acid transporters and disease group, especially Professor Manuel Palacin and Joanna, Dr. Joanna Ford and Adrián Nicolás. And if you have any questions, I will answer them gladly. Okay, I see that there is a raised hand and I will unmute you. Do you hear me? Sure. Very nice presentation, Laya. I, I really you. enjoyed it. I'd like to congratulate you uh, for the amount of work that you've done. And I know that it's not, it's not easy because it's not a long, long period that you work uh, with this grant. Um, I was wondering, when you were showing the size exclusion, um, chromatography results from the, I, I guess it was Bay, Bay AC and the Nanobody 71. Yes. So how they coiled you. Um, were you using DDM there or were the, was the protein, the membrane protein already in, in, the, in the liposomes? Uh, no, it was with DDM. So the size exclusion chromatography is done with DDM and the running buffer contains, uh, I think, 0.06% DDM. Okay, um, because from, from, from the loss of intensity that I see from the nanobody, um, so there's, there's not too much uh, increase in the, in the membrane protein peak, and there's a, a quite a high loss in intensity in the nanobody. Have you checked um, the stability of the nanobody in DDM, like just the nanobody alone? Um, I don't know, so I know that I haven't checked it, but uh, maybe Joanna or Adrian Nicolas um, checked it before me, but it's a pretty small molecule, so I think it should be stable in DDM. 
but I haven't checked it okay. personally. Yeah, well, my my advice would be check it because I've had problems okay. with antibodies and detergents. But um, yeah, I mean, it binds because you show it definitely yeah. by other assays. But um, I guess it's not very important because you will use it. You will be using the, the liposome further on on the studies. But yeah, yes. I would say that when you when you use detergent, just just take a look at it because it, it can be tricky. Okay. And my other question is, um, you were showing also, um, what was it? Wait, uh, yeah, the, the mega body. That, this was a, a bit curious, the 55 kilo Alton one. Mm -hmm. um, um, can you show me again the, the slide where you show uh, with DTT and without DTT? Yes. Uh, here. Can you see it? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, yeah. here. Okay. Because the... Um, so, sorry, my, here. Yeah, yeah, here. My question is, um, when you're using, when you have the, the, um, the mega body alone plus DTT, there's a difference in, in, in the migration of the band, right? Yes. Um, how do you explain this difference in migration? Here in the in the two lanes. Um, well, I actually have no explanation for this, but um, I I don't know. I don't know. It it might be that the DTT interferes in some way, but or that the boiling of the protein. Well, no, the boiling actually wouldn't do anything because it's denatured when you run it, but. What is it? What is the difference between? Sorry, between the two lanes. There's a DTT and one is boiled and the other one is yeah, unboiled? yeah. Oh. So the the one that has DTT has already uh, has also also been boiled. Okay. Yeah. Then now no, now I understand. It makes sense. Um, well, I, I you can think about it later. But the the difference here in migration um, is due to the um, when you boil the 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 membrane protein, it's it's unfolding, I guess. So yeah. Yeah. Then it will well, it will migrate. It, it's it's totally normal. I I was just wondering what why this was. But then um okay okay yeah that's it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and congratulations again for the work. It's it's yeah, great. And thank you for for the questions and the well <laughs> the uh, the comments that you that you gave me. You're welcome. So I don't know if there. Well, Joanna said that the nanobodies are stable, and that yeah, actually the the nanobody seventy one sample is already uh, is also done with uh, DDM. So great, thanks, Joanna. I don't know if there are more questions. Okay, Laya. Thanks a lot for the nice presentation. And uh, I think we can move on uh, with um, Miriam's presentation. So okay. are you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. I'll now try to share the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Right. Uh, good morning. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to present the LMR backbone assignment of a uh, thyroidoxine protein from the Sofiramin nanobite. This uh, work I present has been supervised by Maria Macias, and I would like to thank all the members of the structural characterization of macromolecular assembly in the mechanisms of this program for hosting me within a future environment. So, uh, the group is studying um, new germline-specific thyroidoxins from the Sofila, aiming to find potential applications to use it as a model organism for drug development. Um, we have solved the 3D structure of two of these proteins, and now we need a system that can screen uh, interactions with other molecules. So, NMR is a technique that can do so, and the aim of my project was to obtain the assignment of that. This is one of these techniques. And the results I'm showing you are part of a manuscript under preparation, which describes the structures of these two techniques. And this work has been carried out 
uh, in collaboration with Aitana Otay. So, thyroidoxins are enzymes that regulate the redox homeostasis in all living organisms and all cellular compartments. This is their main function, but they are also involved in the regulation of um, inflammatory responses, apoptosis, and the activity of growth and transcription factors. Um, they have been found overexpressed in some cancer cells, making them a target for um, the development of anti-cancer drugs. And the regulation state, well, they are part of a redox uh, system, and they, they, whether they are in the reduced or oxidated state, is regulated by thyroidoxin red. Uh, thyroidoxins um, interact with a substrate either reducing or oxidating them in a series of um, transfers of electronic charge, both intra and internuclear, that uh, involve four sustained residues. Two of these residues are belong to the substrate, and the other two are part of thyroidoxin's active site, which is made up of two sustains separated by two um, residues. The structure of thyroidoxins is highly conserved among species, and all thyroidoxins have four alpha helices and five beta strands at least. Um, here I show you the um, um, active site in the oxidated state, and as you can see, it is partially exposed, and that facilitates interaction with substrates. All thyroidoxins that have been studied until now have a negative surface charge, but deadhead, which is a protein I have assigned, has a high content of lysine and arginine residues that uh, gives it two positive patches in the surface. This uh, differential um, structural feature and its functions, which are performed in the nucleus of germline uh, cells and include the regulation of uh, chromatin sperm, the oocyte to embryo transition and early embryonic development make it a um, good target for plate control. And what here I show you the, the sequence of the head active cell. So as I've mentioned, the structure of thyroidoxins is quite conserved. And I would like to, well, I have used the, some backbone assignments of other thyroidoxins. Here I show you two bacteria and one from mine that um, as structures are quite similar, chemical sheets of similar amino acids are quite similar, and that has helped in design. To assign the backbone, which uh, here I represent like this, um, the protein has to be expressed with uh, isotopic enrichment of ni um, nitrogen-15 and carbon-15 because uh, to to see this nuclei in, in NMR, they need to have a nuclear spin of one half. So in triple resonance NMR experiments, um, you can think of the chemical shifts each uh, nuclei gives as the coordinate in a CD space, uh, the atoms per um, One of the interesting experiments to have assigned is Brody because it shows the chemical shifts of the nitrogen and hydrogen protons of the amyl bonds. And if you look carefully, you can think of it as the projection of this tube in a frame. But these chemical shifts alone um, cannot uh, be used to assign the protein. So I have used um, uh, the information given by other experiments recorded in the lab with the carbon-15 chemical shifts of the residues. This is what the deadhead um, experiment looks like. And to assign it properly, I have used a combination of these two experiments, which through a small J couplings, which are, well, through small J, through, through J couplings, which are interactions between spin systems, um, I, well, I could see the, um, in the chemical shift of the proton of the amide bonds, the chemical shift of the carbons of the same residue and the one before in this experiment 
for only on the previous one. And these, these graphs I show you here are um, the strips that the software assignment uh, builds to assign the protein. This would be like the slices of the cube I've shown before, put together in the same plane so that you can compare them. So the assignment, the, the, the chemical chips of the carbons in the, well, alpha and beta carbons are used to assign the amide resonances because the chemical chips are, some chemical chips are very characteristic and that enables the identification of some amino acids and from then on you can follow sequential connectivities. Uh, here they are shown with arrows and for example, I would like to exemplify how uh, it's done. This is an adenine residue and it has um, beta carbon in very high in the, this is the carbon free acid. Other amino acids that present characteristical beta shifts are threonines and serines, which show them uh, below the alpha carbons. And for example, glycine, because of its structure, does not have a beta carbon. And thereby, you can see only the alpha carbon, and it's very easy to find them in the spectra. So with these experiments, I managed to assign the amide and alpha and beta carbons of the backbone. And to, to find, finish the assignment, I also used another um, experiment recorded in the lab, which uh, correlated the proton chemical chips of the amide bonds with the carbon-13 um, uh, chemical chips of those of the carbon groups. And with that, I managed to assign almost 90% of all the 107 residues that uh, the protein has. And this is useful because if we have to draw the experiment, we can isolate molecules and see whether they interact and if they do so by, because then the chemical shifts of the residues that interact with these molecules will move. And this will allow for titrations with binders and the mapping of preferred interactions sites and potential hotspots. So uh, thank you for your attention and for um, IRB and the group that supported me this time. If you have questions, I will happily answer them. Okay, thank you so much, Miriam. Um, is there any question? Well, let's go to the chat. Okay. So, Edu, I don't know if it's the one from before, but I don't know if you can uh, talk into the chat and say if you have raised a hand. Yeah, do you hear me? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Very nice work, Miriam. I think it's very impressive that you managed to assign a whole protein and 90%. That's, that's, um, that's a great result from such a short amount of time. I, I was wondering whether you have looked at secondary structure data from, from, the, from the sequence. See if you see like already know where there's like a alpha helix or, or a beta strand. Have, have you had time to look into that already? I haven't checked it, but the group has called the CD structure, so it, it has a typical bioreduction call. Mm -hmm. And well, if I were to examine the chemical shift of the residues, I could probably see whether they, they are placed in groups, alpha helices, or beta strands, because they have some characteristic shifts in, when they are in those areas. Okay, and um, if you had the time now to continue with the project, I don't know if you're gonna continue it, but um, what binders uh, would you look into? Is there anything in the literature that uh, seems interesting to look into? I haven't checked, but some screenings with general libraries would be nice to see whether maybe in those positive patches we could see some interactions or not, but I don't know. Great, thanks, and congratulations again. Thank you, Edu. And is there another question? 
Okay, so uh, Miriam, thank you so much and Lai as well, really nice presentations. And to the rest of you, thank you so much for uh, being here today and we will see you around IRB. Thanks a lot. <laughs>